come before you today wanting you to know that we believe you are our good Father. And, and you know who we are and you love us and you're calling us into this deeper and deeper love. <clears throat> and you don't require from us to, this perfection or this never make mistakes, but you call us into your presence to know you better. And you come to us and you love us. And so, Heavenly Father, we lift our voices today to praise you, give you honor and glory for all that you are and all that you will be and can be for us. Be honored, be honored and glorified today as we lift your voices in worship to you. In your name we pray, amen. We just remain standing. We're going to continue singing through some of these songs. These are songs that our young people enjoy, were chosen for us, so let's just keep going and singing. says, do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may be with me where I am. Galatians says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. And do not be let yourself be burdened by a yoke of slavery. The next song is entitled Overcome. How Christ has overcome for us. Let's sing that. Chapter 7 tells us, I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and make me a prisoner to the law of sin and work that works within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from the body of this death? Thanks be to God who delivers us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Join us in this last one, Whom Shall I Fear? Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, the reality, the truth of these songs is, is powerful. The God who, who, who controls the armies, who could call legions, 10,000 legions of angels, is the one who stands before and behind, who goes with us, who carries us, who walks with us, who cares for us. You are the God that is our victory. You are the one that stands with us at all times power in your hand, sending us out then to take that light to a dying world. God, we ask that as we follow and as we serve, that we would not neglect the responsibility to take the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ into a world that is desperate for something, don't even know what they want, don't even know what they're missing, refuse to turn to the God who can save, the God who can bring some hope some peace, some rest to troubled minds. And so, Heavenly Father, we ask that as we sing these songs of worship and praise, our hearts would be turned in that direction and that we would truly follow and serve you. We ask all this in your holy name. Amen. At this time, we receive the offering, so if the ushers would come, we'll ask God's blessing on your giving. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for what we received. We thank you for what is given. We ask your hand to be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Judges. This morning, we're going to jump out of Acts. This is Youth Sunday. And they all got sick or left. Except two faithful ones. Two faithful ones. You'll meet them in a few minutes. It's why we sang those songs. It's why we jump out of the book of Acts today. Judges chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And we'll get there in a few minutes. We're going to read the whole the, that passage. But when I volunteered to do the youth, to teach the youth a couple years ago, I did it in part because nobody else would. You know, picking up a job by default. 
I believe that our, our youth are an important area, and everybody I talk to believe that our youth are an important area of our church, but nobody would teach them, maybe for fear, maybe for busyness, I don't know. But when nobody else stepped up, I decided to take it over. It messes with my schedule. And since taking on the youth, I visit less, I call fewer people, I study less for Sunday service, and I filled up one more evening in my week. Since taking over this group, I have been richly, richly rewarded. If you don't know, and we don't have a lot, but if you don't know the young people in our church, you need to get to know them. They're an amazing group of young people. They're fun. They're adventurous. They're critical of my handwriting. They're very intelligent, and they're quite progressive. In fact, when we first began, they decided that I needed some fashion tips. So they decided I need to change my hairstyle. I'm not really impressed with that one, although it you know, has some potential, maybe a bit too much gray. Uh, this is an interesting one. Not sure where they got the sunglasses, but um, too Groucho Marxy, I think. Too Groucho Marx looking, not impressed with that one. Uh, the red hair, possibly, never know. Sometimes the kids challenge me to do stuff like this and then they stand on the, on the platform and see what people do. This one I like. This one I like. I haven't grown my hair that long yet, but I'd have to blacken my beard a little bit, but this one I like. Kind of the, kind of the Jesus look, I think. Uh, not impressed with this one either, but you know, they, they tried. They really did try. And I haven't changed anything, but they're still working on me. I also learned that my young people are artists. They write on the board, a big whiteboard down there. They write pretty regularly on the board. Uh, there's some of their artistic endeavors. Some of those relate to the lesson. We do use the board for the lesson as well. Some of those are just um, free drawing. It's another one. I don't even remember what all these are. Sometimes it scares me exactly what they are. We did have one person in our church wasn't sure to wear what they were going to wear for their senior picture, so we drew a picture of what she should look like for her senior pictures. I don't think she accepted that, but we did give it a we did give it the old college tries or the old high school tries. So, you know, the, our, our kids are great. Uh, they want something different than church as usual. They want to talk about issues that are plaguing society and our world today. They don't shy away from lessons about sex. Sometimes pretty interesting lessons about sex. I shy away from it. But they want to talk about this stuff. They want to talk about transgender issues. Some of our kids, some of the kids that in our youth and in our youth groups are wrestling with these very things. Should I have sex? Should I get involved with my boyfriend, my girlfriend? Uh, they're struggling with transgender issues. They have friends that are sexually active. Freshmen, juniors, sophomores, juniors, juniors. They have friends that are sexually active. They have friends that are even transgender. And how do, we, how do we relate to these young people? And is it something for me? What does the Bible say about sex? What is the Bible? So the kids are not afraid to shy away from some of this stuff. And they're wrestling. We try to address some of those questions. Not every week, but we do try to address them as they come up. Uh, they tell me how boring Sunday morning service is. Okay? In all honesty, they're not impressed with what we do on a regular basis on Sunday morning. You know, we sing old hymns with repetitive words. The chorus, the, the, the hymns we sing have repetitive choruses. Now, I'm not saying that the, that the choruses they sing aren't repetitive also, because they are, but they're different. There's a, there's a beat. They, wanna, they want a strong beat. They want a, a driving rhythms and strong rhythms. They want songs that they're hearing on Christian radio today sung that way. So that's why we sang the songs today, and we didn't really do a real good job of it, because we're not used to that. We're not used to singing those songs. Maybe we did it more often. We'd get better at it. Let's see. Uh, these young people are our future. And after having been with these kids for a couple years, I'm a little less nervous about the future. These kids are great. These kids are amazing. And they want to do something. Wanna be, they want to make a difference. Not just in church, but that's kind of our context. They want to make a difference in their lives and in, even in their families and in, in the world. So it's fun to be there. But we owe them. I, I think that we as adults owe them something that we're not giving them. And the first thing I think is we, need to, we, need, we owe them 
to show them how to live for God. Look at Judges chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It says, Then the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to a land of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. You shall make, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore, I also said, I will not drive out before you, them out before you, but they will be thorns in your side, and their gods will be a snare to you. So it was when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voices and wept. It's a very simple concept. Obey God. Do I need to explain that? Obey God. More than that, for our young people, for others, show them what it means. Show them how it is to obey God. Don't just say it. Sometimes don't just do it, but show our young people how to truly serve God. What activities do we do? What activities should we not do? The people of Israel refused to drive out the enemy. Remember, they went into Canaan. They divided the territories between the 12 tribes. And then Joshua and the leader said, now chase the enemy out. Get rid of the Canaanites. They went into the land. They refused to drive them out. They began liking the things that their enemy liked. They began doing the things that their enemies did. They became like their enemies. They became like the people that God said, get rid of. Worst of all, they began worshiping and bowing down to the false gods of their enemy. They began to incorporate everything that their enemies were doing. We owe it to our young people to show them how God wants us to live. Spiritually, we show them what it means to have a personal quiet time and to pray. We demonstrate that. We show them what that means. We show them the importance of Christian fellowship. Culturally, we show them how to accept people without necessarily affirming everything, all the choices or lifestyles those people make. We can be friends with someone and truly care about someone without accepting everything that they choose to do in life. And we need to show how that's done. We need to demonstrate that to the young people that come across our path. We owe it to our young people to show them what it means to love, have joy, experience peace, show patience, exhibit kindness, be filled with goodness, demonstrate faithfulness, show gentleness, and exercise self-control. We owe that to our young people. We should not be completely at home in this culture, in this society. But we show our young people how to live and be faithful in this culture and in this society, in this generation. This is not our home. Don't make it home. God is calling us to a better place someday. We need to learn to live. We need to show our young people how to live. We owe them uh, to show them how to live for God. Second thing we need that we owe them is to take leadership, godly leadership. Okay, we need we need to be the ones that tell people why we do what we do, why we as Christians do what we do. Judges chapter two, down in verse. Hang on. Judges chapter 2, verse 7. The 7 was too small. I couldn't read it. It says, So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen the great works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. Now Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old. And they buried him within the border of his inheritance at timnath Harris in the mountains of Ephraim, on the north side of Mount Gash. When all the generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. Scariest words in the Bible. Nobody took leadership. Nobody spread the word, not just how to serve God, but why they served God. Why, why, why do we do these things that we do as Israel? Nobody extolled 
all the things that God had done for them. And as a result, a generation arose who did not know the Lord or any of the things that God had done. Because nobody stepped up to tell them why. Scariest words in the Bible. Why was that the case? Because the adults didn't do what the adults were supposed to do. The adults didn't tell them what they were doing. Exodus chapter 12 says, records the institution of the Passover. They're commanded to keep the Passover forever. The reason they were to keep the Passover is so they wouldn't forget the deliverance that God had given them in Egypt. It says this, starting verse 24, Exodus 12, 24. It says, Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter in the land of the, that the Lord will give you, as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, let, let me read that again. I didn't add that. It's here. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean? What, why are we doing this? Tell them. It's the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. We don't do this Passover because it's fun. We don't do this Passover because we think it's a good idea. We do this Passover, son, daughter, because God spared our lives in Egypt. We could have died with the Egyptians. Remember the whole firstborn, blood on the top, blood on the doorpost? We do this so we never forget the mercy of God in delivering us from the hand of Egypt. Deuteronomy 6, God reminds Israel to keep the commandments and statutes that God has set down. Keep the laws. Obey the laws. Keep these things. And, and they kept them because it was a constant reminder of the miracle God had accomplished in delivering them from slavery. Deuteronomy 6, verse 20, starting in 20, we read this. In the future, when your son asks you, now let, me, let me read that again. When your son, and I'm going to add, or daughter, asks you, why do we have to do all this stuff? Why do we have to keep the statutes and decrees and the laws? And Why do we have to do all this stuff? This is what you say. We were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand before our eye. Before our eyes, the Lord sent signs and wonders, great and terrible, on Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us out from that there to bring us and give us the land he promised an oath to our ancestors. The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God so that, so that we might always prosper and be kept alive as is the case today. We don't keep the law because it's a good idea. We keep the law because it's a reminder of what God has delivered us from. We keep, the, we keep the statutes of God because it's the way we need to live our lives, not because he told us to, but because it's the way we need to live our lives so we remember the deliverance that God brought us. The laws are not a drudgery. They were given to remind us of deliverance from sin. In Joshua chapter 4, there's a record of them crossing the Jordan. It's actually when they entered into Canaan. Finally, they get there, wandering in the wilderness 40 years, finally get to Canaan, get into the land, and it says this, And Joshua set up at Gilgal the twelve stones that they had taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, In the future, when your descendants ask their parents, In the future, when they ask you, What's that pile of stones for? What's that pile of stones for? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until, until you crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when, they, when he dried it up before, the, before us until we crossed over. So did, he did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. See that pile of stones, son? We were coming along. We were walking to the Jordan. It was rushing. It was going to flood season. Falling down. We stepped in the water and boom, the water stopped. That's how powerful our God is. He can stop the water. Not only stop the water, he dried up the ground because it's kind of muddy. I don't want to walk through mud. I want to drop on dry ground. Don't tell me that there was a, a, a rock slide up river that stopped the water. And as soon as the Israelites got through, the rock suddenly magically broke loose and the water started. No. My God said, I'm stopping the water, drying the ground. You walk through. 
That's why that pile of stones is there, son. Because it demonstrates the power of God in, for us and even in us. Joshua chapter 4. Here's a simulated conversation between a teenager and their parent. Teenager. Mom, Dad, why do we have to go to church? It's boring. We sing 200-year-old songs, stand for 20 minutes, then we listen to the preacher drone on and on and on about stuff we don't understand. Why do we have to go? Or do we have to go? Parent, yes, we have to go. Teenager, why? Why do we have to go? Okay, here's some possible answers to that question of why. Because if we don't fill all the pews, the pastor's fragile ego is hurt and he pouts for days. You wouldn't want that. Another possible answer. We go so we look good to other people who will go to church. If we, don't go to, if we don't go, people will think we're bad Christians. Another possible response. How about this one? We go to church because we've always gone to church. We go to church. Grandpa went to church. Great-grandpa went to church. Great-great-grandpa built the church. We go to church because we've always gone to church. Not this one. Church isn't supposed to be fun. <clears throat> we just go because we have to. How about this one? We go to church because in going to church on Sunday, we are reminded that on the first day of the week, Jesus rose from the dead, giving us new life. If we stop going to church, we risk forgetting the great salvation Jesus won for us when he died and rose again. That's why we go to church. The Bible says that after Jesus ascended into heaven, the church, the, the Jews, the church began meeting on the first day of the week. Why? Because they were commemorating the ascension of Jesus Christ. The res I'm sorry, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why do we come to church? Because we come to church on the first day of the week to remember that Jesus rose on the first day of the week. You don't come to sing good songs and hear great sermons. You might get that. We come to church because we need to remember. And in not going to church, we, have, we risk forgetting why we're here. We're here for one reason. To be reminded that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And in doing so won the victory for us. That's why we go to church. Do you explain to children, to your young people, why we do things? Why do we celebrate Advent? I love Advent. It's, it's my favorite, what, five sermons of the, of the year. I love Advent. Why do we do it? Because it's the most wonderful time of the year? No. We do it because we need to be reminded that God sent His Son to live among us. We need to be reminded that Christmas is a great time, and I have no problem with Santa and the gifts and the decorations. That's fine, but don't forget Christmas has one purpose, and it's to remind us that Jesus came and died or, or to live with us, eventually to die, but it's to remind us that the Son of God lived among us, Emmanuel, God with us. That's why we celebrate Advent and Christmas. Why, why Good Friday? It's Friday. You've got a bunch of family coming the next day or on Sunday. You don't have time to come to church and hear. No. So why do we do Good Friday? Because we need to remember that Christ died. We need to remember that he was nailed to a cross. Because if we don't celebrate these days, we risk forgetting. We risk forgetting the real reason. Oh, it's always in the back of our head. And we always have the spiritual answer. But if we don't, if we don't, Focus on these days, we forget, or we act, we act in ways that it's like we forgot. Why do we do Easter? Because we need to remember the resurrection. We have to remember the resurrection. Without the resurrection, we are dead. We're hopeless. We might as well all go home. But with the resurrection, we have life. My mother passed away. You all know that. I'm excited for my mom. I miss her, of course. She's in heaven. Why? Because he rose from the dead. She rose from the dead. Amen. Thank God. She's up with him. Now, I don't know. My, I don't know if she sees people she knows. She knows a lot of people in heaven or that went. Do you know what she's seeing now? Jesus. That's why we celebrate Easter. 
Uh, Sunday school, we come because it's good to learn from one another. It's valuable. We don't just come so the pastor can be witty. We come to learn from one another. It's one of the things I love about my class is they're not afraid to give opinions. They're not afraid to say, I think you're wrong. This is what I think. It's a great thing to learn. We owe it to our young people to take leadership and tell them why we do what we do and not just that we do it. When I took scuba diving lessons many, many years ago, one of the things, they, they beat, basically they beat two things into you. One of them is never panic. Because panic is never good in any situation. And the second thing is never hold your breath. When you're down 20 or 30 feet and you suddenly run out of oxygen, what's your natural reaction? Hold your breath. But if you hold your breath as you ascend, your lungs will blow up and that doesn't end well. So they not only tell you why to do, or what to do, they tell you why, and it makes total sense. It's the same thing with faith. Why do we celebrate? Why do we come on Sunday morning? Why do we read our Bible? Why do we pray? Why do we do these things? Because they're reminders of the different aspects of faith. And to stop doing them, just like Israel, forget. <clears throat> we also owe it to our young people to teach them about God so that God won't turn against them. Judges 2, verse, starting verse 11, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, served the Baals and the Asherahs. They forsook the Lord God of, of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, and they followed and bowed down to the gods of the people who were all around them. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, so he delivered them into the hands of the plunderers who despoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of the enemies all around so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. The hand of the Lord was against them for calamity and they were greatly distressed. We mistakenly teach our teenagers that God will always forgive, always defend, always be giving, always be blessing, always giving victory. And that's not true. That is not true. If we wander from God, if we bow to the gods of society, money, popularity, acceptance, alcohol, sports, if we bow to the gods of society and forsake God, then God will do what he has to do in order to bring us back. Does the violence in America bother you? Then get on your knees and pray that God comes back. Because that, I believe, that a lot of the violence in America today is caused because God is trying to get our attention and we refuse to turn. And yes, the church, maybe I'm preaching to the choir, I get that. But society refuses to turn to God and so God will continue to pursue. And we need to teach our young people to, to, to follow, to obey, to keep serving God so that he will bless them and not just pursue them, not just go after them. We owe it to our young people to welcome them into church to sing the songs that they like, to be lively. They don't have to change. And we don't have to change. Let's face it, I'm Baptist. Change comes hard. I'm 61. Change comes even harder. But God is not asking us to change. What he's asking us is to accept one another as we are. Uh, enjoy the music of our young people. Young people enjoy the songs of the older people. They're good. It's good stuff. We don't sing any bad songs here, right, Betsy? Amen. We just need to celebrate each generation as they are. Okay, at this time I want to bring our young people up here. Now, as I said, uh, go ahead, Carrie and Zoe. Uh, they don't want to come up. They let me know on Wednesday night. They do not want to come up here, but... They said they would humor me and they would come up here. Now, we also run into the problem that many of them are sick. They're gone. They're not able to be here. In fact, the ones who were hounding me most to sing these songs didn't show up today. And they're probably watching. And I will tell you right now, Bethany, you're in trouble, okay? Because you wanted these songs and now you're not here. We'll talk, you and I. We're not large. Um, a big group is seven or eight people. We have two that are graduating. Taylor, uh, Taylor is heading to Ross this fall, and then Avery is going to Grand Valley to college. 
I expect amazing and great things out of those two. They're intelligent, they're brave, and they're just, they're great. The rest of them I get a little bit long, I get for a little bit longer. <laughs> a couple more years, that's right. We recently lost a couple of them. Uh, Casey Craig, who's actually been in, in our Awana program for probably 10 or more years, uh, Casey and Ryan, Craig's parents, got better jobs in Florida, and so they left us even just last week. And I actually was texting Casey today, things are not going well, and he didn't really expand too much on that, but he's struggling with missing his friends up here, and we need to pray for Casey. He's, he's a great kid, but he's struggling right now. We just need to pray for Casey, and I would ask you to pray for Casey Craig. He's wrestling with some issues. He's 16 and left all his friends here, and he says, I know I'll make new friends, he said, but it's hard. Okay, pray for Casey. <clears throat> but these are my spiritual children, and I love them to death, and I'm terrified every time I go down there. But these kids are wonderful. And uh, our kids are Avery, Taylor, Tyler, Bethany, Aaron, Casey and Ryan, Craig, I still claim them, and Zoe, the only, and Carrie, the only two that made it are Carrie and Zoe. So I just want to close today by praying for our kids, praying for our youth. And they want to get out of here as fast as I can. So I'm going to make this prayer short, and then we'll close. Pray with me. Father, I thank you for our group. And we're not going to be written up in any youth journals. But Father, we love each other. We love one another, and we have a good time. We learn about the things of God. I pray for each one, for Avery and Taylor as they head off to post-graduate or post-high school educations in college and vocational. I pray for Tyler as he continues to work, for Bethany and Aaron as they continue their high school days and, and that they would do well, for Carrie and Zoe as they also continue to learn and grow. Father, we pray for Casey and Ryan, and particularly Casey. He's wrestling right now. He's, he's having a tough time leaving friends. Uh, and as we parents know, we make our kids do the things that we think we should do. And that's kind of where he is right now. So be with him as he settles into his new area in Florida, so I believe in the Tampa area. Just bless him especially, we pray. But for all these young people, they face a, a, a wild world, a great world, an exciting world. They need your guidance. They need your wisdom. We pray for it. We ask all this in your name. Amen. You may go unless you want to stay up here. Okay. Let's stand as we close. We close with the doxology this morning. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.